So, this is going to be one video of a uh, two video series where I'm going to talk about game processing. Um, today I went fishing and I caught a bass and a few catfish. So I'm going to show you how you can process both of them. Now, really all you need to process any kind of fish is a sharp tool. That can be a rock or a knife, but what I'm going to talk about in this video is filleting. Now, primarily what you're going to need filleting a fish, you're going to need a pair of pliers, or you're going to need a knife, a good sharp knife. Uh, a lot of people would prefer to use fillet knives, not me. I honestly prefer to use just a normal, everyday um, outdoor knife, hunting knife, uh, my survival knives, my mora, my dog. I've used all of them. Now, here's all my fish. Now, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them all off the stringer. Now, there's my bass. Not a big one. Nothing fancy. Very good, though. I caught him off a of, uh, cat line. Bottom fishing. My catfish. You don't really have to flight, you don't really have to skin them. <clears throat> but personally, I would recommend it. So, first one I'm going to show you how to process is going to be the bass. So, I'm going to throw these over here. Bring the bass over here. First thing I'll do with a fish that has scales is I'll scale it. Usually, I just use the back of my knife. Try and get as many the scales as you can. You can use the sharper side of the knife, but it's not totally necessary, and you might cut either the meat or yourself. Alright, then you flip over and do the same thing on the other side. If you look at the ground in this barn, you'll see almost an entire carpet of fish scales. I have done hundreds of fish in here. You, know, you want to get these scales right here, just behind the head, right in this area, because that's where you're going to cut up to for your fillet. So make sure you get everything. A lot of times people will miss scales right here, right here, and right here, and also along the spine right here. Those are the most often missed areas. Now I'm not sure if this knife is going to be sharp enough. To do this properly, if it's not, I'll just switch to my mora. I know that's good. No. Alright, so what I like to do is I like to make my first slice right here at the tail. I'll actually stick my fingers into the gills and spread my hand over the entire fish like this to help myself get grip on it. And then I'll just slowly try and work my way up. And I'll try and feel that bone. All right. Once you get up in there a little bit, see the bones? You want to follow those. Once you get it off the spine initially, it'll be a lot easier. Now I can do this a lot quicker, but usually I don't get as clean of a meat cut that way. And after I get that started, I'll come up here. And I'll run down right here behind the spoon. Make sure I don't get any bones in it. Now 
I've got a boom going on right here. Gotta get rid of that. Because we don't want that. There we go. Alright. Once you get this all opened up, what you're going to do is you're going to make a slice right here. See how the gill lifts up right here? You want to literally get just behind the gill into that meat. And slice all the way down to the bone. Alright, and now you just want to get it off of the rib cage. Just kind of lightly cut at it. And it will start to free itself and free itself. And here we go. And then, switch to the other side. Now that I can see the ribs, I mean not the ribs, the um, spine, the spinal column. Um, it's a lot easier. So, get over, but not very far over. We'll run down. There we go. Cut into the tail. Cut up. Separate it from the spine column. And we're going to make a nice little incision. Right here, we're going to start peeling it off of the ribs. And then what I like to do once I get to this point is I like to just go ahead and poke it through right there. Just depending on which hand is your dominant hand. Depends on which side it's going to be a little harder for you than the other. There we go. And then just finish the cut. There you go. Problem solved. That's how you fillet a normal fish. A catfish on the other hand is a little bit different. I much prefer to skin those. So first what you want to do is find that bony area in the head which will be right here and get behind that into the meat and make that same kind of incision you can actually go a little further down if you like because I cut in a little early you're going to do that on both sides then you're going to this top fin right here you're going to cut around that on both sides almost creating like an eyelet You just want to cut through the skin. You don't want to cut into the meat yet. And then you're going to want to cut all the way down the back. This part is actually a lot easier if you just use a uh, razor from like a box cutter. same incision on the other side okay now once you've done that you get your pliers out you grip it that skin right there get a good grip and just rip it right on off it'll come off nice and easy for a cat about this size and a little bit bigger but the bigger you get the harder the skin is to rip off all right that peeled off really nicely now we can see our meat once again I do the same thing I will actually stick my finger inside right here 
to get grip. Press it down. Base of the tail. Now, it's another way you can actually fillet a fish is once you get down against that bone, just stay hard against it and go up. Now, you will lose a tiny little bit of meat that way, but not much. People have a tendency to think you lose a lot of meat when you fillet a fish, when you actually don't lose as much as people under the impression seem to think. But I do prefer doing it the other way because I do get more meat out of it. But I just wanted to show you all this way. This way is much quicker. And one thing I really like about catfish is for the size of the animal, there is a lot of meat on them. There's your beautiful catfish fillet. Then, do the other side. You can wipe off the dirt if you want, or you can wash it off later once it gets into your house. I was tagged what originally got me into bushcraft. Well, nothing specifically, actually. Um, I'd always been kind of a woods person, but here recently, or well, not really recently, rather, but within the last 10 years was when I really got into it. It was there that I started to teach myself everything. Um, when I was much younger, maybe six, seven. My grandfather took me squirrel hunting, killed my first squirrel, but unfortunately we didn't find it. Um, I had always been somewhat close to the outdoors, just not quite as much as I am now. I didn't spend very much time in the outdoors until my preteen years, 10, 11, 12. Um, beforehand, before that, I would, on occasionally, go on walks down to the creek with my mom, my dad, or my grandfather, or one of them. You know, nothing really serious, nothing really fancy. Um, I was always in, in, interested in fires. Anytime somebody would light a fire, I was there. Always. I would always be ragging on everybody. Please, can you light a fire? Can you light a fire? Can you light a fire? That was like my favorite thing to watch. So, then for a few years, maybe two, actually, I kind of went silent. I went blank. And I never really went in the woods during that time. And then, after that, I joined Civil Air Patrol. To this day, I don't remember why I joined Civil Air Patrol. I don't remember what motivated me to do so. But I did. And I was there for a while. And then I heard about their search and rescue um, squadron. Or their search and rescue team. And there, that's where I joined search and rescue. There, I made my first three-day backpack. I learned some wilderness navigation skills, uh, a couple basic survival skills, a couple not, but primarily search techniques. They didn't focus too terribly much on survival, but the survival thing was my favorite thing. 
I got really, really, really into it. So much that I dedicated all my free time after that to learning survival. I got my first few books. I don't remember the exact name of my first book, but it was one of those kid ones, and they're actually pretty good. Um, reading back on it, once I was actually way more advanced with myself, I was very impressed. But anyway, um, Mr. Blair didn't really do much of the survival, so I spent most of my free time trying to learn it myself. So I started reading a whole bunch of books and so forth. That's where I learned everything. Books and YouTube. A lot of stuff from books and YouTube. That is the very large majority of where I learned everything. Well, actually, I can't say that in entirety because some of it was trial and error. And it's just taken off since then. Excuse me, taken off. I have a very bad issue with saying tooken for some odd reason. And everybody rags on me for it because it's not a real word. But anyway, and I mean, that's really it. The bow drill was the hardest thing for me to learn. That's what took the longest. It took me years. I'm not 100% sure why. I think it was actually my wood selection. Now that I think back on it. It could have been poor wood. Wood that wasn't dry enough. Um, you know, just something along those lines. Probably. Could be wrong. But I think that's what the problem ended up being. Most of everything else didn't really take me that long to learn. My favorite things was trapping and shelter building. The science behind survival fascinates me and still fascinates me to this day. Anytime I can learn a new survival skill or try something new, I want to. As a matter of fact, here in the next week, I'm planning on trying to make my first build for a primitive crossbow. But that's really what got me into survival, was search and rescue. I guess is what you could say, search and rescue. And from there, I got into prepping. And now, my entire philosophy is based on primitive wilderness living skills. I'm modeling my entire mindset after how the natives worked. Because to me, the natives are the ultimate survivalist. There is so much we can learn from what they can do and what they have done. So, hope you all enjoyed this video. Um, I'll see you all in the next one. Don't y'all forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Share my video. Um, spread it around um, and
as an FYI, I do have a giveaway coming up, as I have not done one yet. Um, I have it coming up for the 1,000 subscriber mark. Once I get there, mm -hmm. prize to surprise. But I'm quite certain y'all will like it. Anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Share my video. Um, uh, if you go to my YouTube, my channel, and you look inside my channel icon, not channel icon, the, the channel paper, the banner, that's it. Uh, you will see a link for my Facebook. And for my uh, own personal website, on that website is where I post predominantly uh, my photographs. Now, all my photographs aren't on there. Not even a quarter of them is on there. <laughs> really, not even a fraction of them is on there. But they are on there. It's open for public view. And I would appreciate it if y'all stop by there and tell me what y'all like, what y'all don't like, what y'all would like to see different. And any just feedback period. Check out my Facebook. Um, I do go to that Facebook often. I do watch it. I don't post on there very often because it's really not that much activity on there. It's only 20 something people on there. Whew, that kind of hurt. Anyway, see y'all in the next video.